The Early Cavemen by Catherine Elizabeth Dopp. Chapter 1. Why People Wanted to Live in Caves Did you know that people once lived in caves? Perhaps you would like to know how it happened. Long before people lived in caves, they lived in the largest trees they could find. This was before they had learned to use fire. But after a while, they learned to use fire, and they no longer feared to make homes on the ground. They built brush huts of the rudest kind. They lived in these huts for many years. For a long time, it was warm on the wooded hills, but after a while, it began to grow cold. The ground was covered with snow and ice. Cold winds swept over the wooded hills. Snow beat into the rude brush huts, and cold winds whistled through the branches. People shivered with the winter's cold. They needed a warm shelter, but they did not know how to make one. Many of them had been in caves, but they did not dare stay very long. Some caves were the homes of big cave bears, others the dens of hyenas. Sabretooth also lived in a cave. People knew that these animals were dangerous creatures. Many a time they had barely escaped from the claws of a cave bear. Many a time they had been chased by a pack of hyenas. They did not want to enrage these creatures. Least of all did they want to enrage old Sabretooth. He was the fiercest creature on the hills. When he came out of his cave, the forest was still. Scarcely an animal dared stir. Even the rhinoceros and mammoth feared to attack him. He was as sly as a cat and as powerful as a rhinoceros. He had two saber teeth that were sharp and strong. No such animal as Sabretooth lives now. There were only a few animals like him then, but they were more feared than any other creature. He was something like a lion and something like a tiger, but he was more powerful than either. He did not like to live in the cold, so each winter he went to the south. Each summer he came back again. How glad everyone was to see him go. How they hoped he would never return. How they wished they might have his cave for a home. Things to do. Model the wooded hills in your sandbox. Make a brush hut to show where the people lived. Show where the caves are. Tear from paper the animals that lived in caves. Plan a way of getting a cave for a home. Chapter 2. Things to think about. What happens to the trees and plants just before winter? What do the animals that you know do before the winter comes? Do you know what people do to get ready for winter? How the Fire Clan Got a Cave Summer was almost gone. The oak and the birch trees were dropping their leaves, and all the plants were showing signs of the frost. The wild animals were getting ready for winter. Some of them were crawling into their holes. Others were starting for the south. The Fire Clan hoped that in a few days Sabretooth would go. They wanted his cave for the winter, so they kept watch of all that he did. They knew that he slept in his cave all the day and seldom left it except at night. One morning, Strong Arm saw him come out of the cave and start off toward the south. He believed that Sabretooth was going away, so he hurried and told his people. How glad they were to hear such news! How excited they were as they took their firebrands and followed Strong Arm to the cave! When they reached the cave, they paused a moment while Strong Arm crept in through the mouth. When he was sure that it was safe for them to follow, he beckoned to them with his hand. One by one, they crept through the mouth of the cave, their firebrands lighting the dark way. It seemed strange to be in such a dark place, but they knew that it was safe and warm. They all wanted to keep it for a home, but they knew that wild animals would try to get it. So the women gathered armfuls of branches and started a fire just outside the mouth. As the fire began to flame up toward the sky, the men gathered around and watched it blaze. The children played beside the fire or watched their mothers gather branches. All the people were near the fire when, suddenly, they were startled by a shriek of terror. Mothers clasped their children to their breasts, and fathers grasped their knives to be ready to fight. All eyes were soon fixed upon Firekeeper. She stood trembling so that she could hardly speak, but she pointed toward a thicket. The men stepped cautiously toward it, but Firekeeper pulled them back. Then she told them what she had seen. It was Sabretooth trying to come back to the cave. When the Fire Clan heard this, they were filled with terror. They huddled around the fire. Nobody knew what to do. Yet everybody knew that something must be done, for their lives were not safe as long as Sabretooth was near. Things to do. Show how the cavemen kept watch of the caves of the wild animals. Show how Strong Arm led the Fire Clan into Sabretooth's cave. Draw a picture of the people marching to the cave. Show how the women broke branches of wood and carried them to the fire. 
Draw a picture of the women and children gathering wood for the fire. Chapter 3. Things to think about. How do you think the fire clan will spend the first evening in the cave? Who will be apt to keep watch that night? The first night in the cave. At sunset, the children were nodding their heads and soon were fast asleep. The women tended the fire while the men sat around and talked. All the beasts of prey were out for the night. Sometimes the fire clan could see their shadows in the open spaces near the cave. Then they were glad that they had fire. But they knew that they would have trouble as long as Sabretooth was near. So they began to plan ways of getting rid of him. They did not dare risk an open fight with such weapons as they had. So they tried to invent a new way. They planned a long time, but they could not decide what to do. At length, all but Firekeeper crept into the cave, where they were soon asleep upon the rough floor. Firekeeper stayed beside the fire and kept watch all alone. She was the oldest woman of the clan, and people said that she was the daughter of the fire. She always kept it burning. As she tended the fire through the long night, she heard all sorts of sounds. Once a cave bear passed close to the cave, but he sniffed and ran when he saw the fire. Then a pack of hyenas crept up toward the cave. They seemed to be looking for a safe place to rest. But as soon as they saw the fire, they ran. Other animals, too, ran when they saw the fire. Firekeeper was not afraid when she was near the fire, but it seemed that the long night would never end. When at last the sky became red in the east, she knew that morning was coming again. At the break of day, all the people awoke. It was only a few minutes before they were ready to take up work for another day. Things to do. Show how the children fell asleep. Draw a picture of them. Show how the cave bear acted when he saw the fire. Draw the picture. Show how Firekeeper kept watch during the night. Draw a picture of her as she was keeping watch. Get up early some morning and watch the sunrise. Paint a picture of a sunrise. End of section one. Section two of the early cavemen. Chapter four. How the Fire Clan Got Rid of Sabretooth. Things to think about. Do you know what kind of weapons the Fire Clan had at this time? Why would it not be safe for the Fire Clan to attack Sabretooth with such weapons? What kinds of weapons can you make of stones and sticks? What do you think the Fire Clan will do to get rid of Sabretooth? Do you think that the Fire Clan ate three meals together each day as we do? How the Fire Clan Got Rid of Sabretooth. As soon as the sun was up, Messengers started from the cave to ask the people on the hills for help. Nobody stopped to eat breakfast. The cavemen never ate breakfast together. Each ate by himself such food as he could find. Everybody was watching for Sabretooth. Soon, sharp eyes saw him crawl into a thicket, where he laid himself down and went to sleep. Then the messengers returned with the people from the hills. They went to the thicket to see Sabretooth, but they did not dare attack him. They had learned to put handles on their flint points so as to make good hunting knives. But the handles were short, and it was not safe to attack Sabretooth with such weapons. Their axes and hammers were larger and stronger, but they were afraid to use them now. While they were all wondering what to do, Strongarm went to look at Sabretooth again. The creature had feasted all night long and was sleeping heavily. He was lying just under a strong spreading branch of an old oak. When Strongarm noticed this, his eyes brightened. He motioned to an old man to come to him. After a few minutes, they went back to the other men. All crowded around, for they felt sure that Strongarm had thought of a new plan. Then Strongarm showed the people what he wanted them to do. Everybody was eager to help. The women brought out all the skins that they had. Strongarm laid the strongest skin aside and told the women to cut the others into straps. Some of the men began to work upon large flint points. Others cut a tough branch of oak and made it into a large shaft. When all had finished their work, they brought what they had to Strongarm. He selected the largest and strongest flint point and bound it to the end of the shaft. He folded the skin so as to make a bag. Then he tied the skin bag to the shaft. The boys brought stones to fill the bag and laid them on the ground. Everything was now ready, so Strongarm took the new weapon over his shoulder and climbed into the oak tree. Others followed with stones and straps. Strongarm quickly fastened the upper end of the shaft to the spreading branch of the oak. Then he carefully filled the skin bag with stones and let the weighted spear hang over Sabretooth. He motioned to the men to go back to the cave and was soon all alone with Sabretooth. He did not stop to think what might happen. He grasped his stone knife and began to cut the heavy strap. 
When he had almost cut through the strap, it snapped. The spear fell with its heavy weight and pinned Sabretooth to the ground. Sabretooth made one desperate effort to escape. Then he lay perfectly still on the ground. How thankful the cavemen were. They had one less creature to fear. They now felt that they would be able to keep the cave for a home. Things to do. Notice how gracefully the cat moves. Notice how it gets ready to spring. Think of an animal many times larger than the cat and see if you can model saber-tooth in clay. See if you can find good stones for hunting knives and spears. Name a tool or a machine that you have seen in which a weight is used. Draw a picture of it. Chapter 5. Things to think about. What do you think the cavemen will do with Sabretooth's skin? What will they do with his teeth and claws? What will they do with his flesh? Can you think of what they might do with the bones? How do you think they learn to cook food? Preparations for the feast. How excited all the people on the hills were when they knew that Sabretooth had been killed. Everybody wanted to see him. Young and old crowded around to see the monster as he lay stretched out on the ground. They gazed at the creature in silence. They admired his rich, tawny stripes. Not a man on the hills had ever before been able to get such a skin. They all wished they might have it, but they knew it belonged to Strongarm. They examined the two large saber teeth. They felt on the smaller teeth and claws. At length, the men began to quarrel about the trophies, but Strongarm waved them back. He claimed one saber tooth for himself and allowed the other to go to the brave old man. When Strongarm spoke, the men kept silent, for they knew that the trophies belonged to the bravest men. But they were given a share in the smaller teeth and claws. While they were loosening them with stone hammers, the women were hunting for their stone knives. They were soon busy taking off Sabretooth's beautiful skin. When the heavy skin was off, they began to get ready for the feast. They ate pieces of raw flesh as they worked and tossed pieces to the men and boys. They were all too hungry to wait for the feast. Besides, they were used to eating raw meat, but they had learned how to cook meat at this time. They had learned to roast meat in hot ashes. At first, they roasted the animal in its skin, but now they knew a better way. They skinned the animal and cut out the ribs, then they buried them in the hot ashes. They covered the ashes with hot coals. They cut slices of meat with their stone knives and put them on roasting sticks. Then they held these sticks over the hot coals, just as we sometimes do today. Things to do. Make believe that you are doing some of the work that the cavemen did, and see if anyone can guess what it is. See if you can cook something over the coals. Ask someone to read you a story that Charles Lamb wrote about roast pig. Chapter 6. Things to think about. How do you think the cavemen would act at a feast? What would they use for dishes? What would they do to entertain themselves and their neighbors? When would the neighbors go home? The feast. Nobody knew just when the feast began. Nobody set the table, for there was no table to set. But the women brought bowls they had made out of hollow gourds. Before the meat was half cooked, everybody was eating. Some ate thick slices that had been partly roasted on the sharp sticks. Others chewed raw meat from bones which they tore from the carcass. The children sucked strips of raw meat and picked the scraps from the ground. When the women lifted the ribs out of the hot ashes, they found a nice gravy. They dipped up the gravy in their gourd bowls and gave it to the men. Strongarm dipped some up with a bone dipper that had been made from the skull of a cave bear. Then he tore out a rib from the carcass and gnawed the meat from the bone. They all held what they ate in their hands. They all ate very fast and they ate a long time. At last their hunger was satisfied, and they began to crack the marrow bones and scrape the marrow out with sharp sticks and bones. When the men became tired of sucking the bones, they tossed them to the women and children. Then the men joined in a hunting dance while the women beat time with the bones. The women chanted, too, as they beat time. They danced until all became tired and the visitors were ready to go. Then Firekeeper loaded pieces of meat upon the backs of the women, and all gathered around to see the neighbors start home. As soon as they were gone, the cavemen prepared to rest for the night. Things to do. Take turns in doing something that the cavemen did at the feast, and let the children guess what it is. Find some good marrow bones and crack them. Find out whether we use marrow bones for anything today. If you think that you can, make something of the marrow bones. Can you think why bones are filled with marrow? See if you can beat time with marrow bones so as to help someone do his work. See if you can make dishes of pumpkins, squashes, melons, cucumbers, or anything else that you can find. End of section two.
Section 3 of the Early Cavemen Chapter 7 How the Cave Was Made Ready for a Winter Home Things to Think About If you were going to live in a cave that had been taken from a wild animal, what would you do to make it comfortable? What do you think the cavemen did? What do you think the cavemen found in the cave? What kind of beds do you think they made? If they built a fire inside the cave, do you think that the smoke would pass out? Where do you think that they would make their fireplace? Where do we make our fireplaces? How do we keep the smoke from getting into our rooms? How the cave was made ready for a winter home. The morning after the feast, Firekeeper built a fire inside the cave. Then all went in to look at the cave, but the smoke soon drove them out. So Firekeeper raked out the fire with a branch of spruce wood and waited for the smoke to go out. Then the cavemen took firebrands and crept inside and stood up and walked around. Bones of animals were strewn upon the rough, rocky floor. Pieces of rock shaped like icicles hung from the roof and stood up from some parts of the floor. Drops of water trickled down from the roof. Layers of rock jutted out from the walls like shelves. The cavemen walked through the large, dry cavern until they came to a narrow passage. Then they stopped to see where it led. They peered into the darkness but saw nothing. They listened, but heard no sound. Since no one wanted to creep through the passage, they turned back toward the mouth. The dry cavern near the mouth was large enough for a home, so the cavemen thought no more of the narrow passage. Before the men went out of the cave, they picked up armfuls of bones for weapons. They carried them out by the fire and sat down and worked upon them. The women cleared away piles of bones, so as to make a smooth place to sleep. Then they went out among the trees to find something to cover the floor. They broke off small branches of evergreens and carried them into the cave. The children brought armfuls of moss and leaves and scattered them over the hard, rocky floor. When the beds were finished, they made a fireplace. They dug a shallow hole just outside the cave and walled it around with stones. Perhaps you would not call this a good fireplace, but it was the best fireplace anyone had at that time. Things to do Visit a cave when you have a chance to do so. Collect pictures of caves. Model a cave in clay or make one in the ground. Find out what caves are used for nowadays. Make a fireplace out of doors and cook something in the hot ashes. Chapter 8. Things to think about. What do you think the beads you wear are made of? Can you think of how they were made? What do you think the cavemen used for beads? What did they wear for ornaments besides beads? Can you think how they bored holes through their ornaments? What does the carpenter use to bore holes with? How does the woodpecker bore holes? How the cavemen bored holes through their trophies? For several days after the feast, the cavemen did not hunt. As long as they had meat, they stayed near the cave and worked upon their trophies. They were trying to bore holes through the teeth and claws, so as to string them and wear them for ornaments. Strongarm was working upon the big saber tooth. When he had worked for some time, the cavemen gathered around to see how deep a hole he had made. Some of the men said that he could never do it, but others thought that it could be done. Strongarm was tired, so he rested a while and talked to the people about boring holes. He told what he had heard when he was a boy. All the grown people had heard what he said many times, but they were always ready to hear it again. Besides, they wished their children to hear it. So old and young gathered around to hear what Strongarm said. They all looked and listened as Strongarm showed the children how to make holes with awls. As he spoke, the people picked up thorns or sharp bones and punched them through some object. Then Strongarm showed them a bone awl that he had made to punch holes through seeds and thin shells. But they could not punch holes through teeth and claws, so they learned to twirl the awls in their hands. Strongarm did not know how people learned to do this, but he thought that they learned it when at play. He took a round stick that had a sharp point and twirled it back and forth on his thigh. The other cavemen twirled too, for they wanted to show the children how to bore holes. The children soon learned how to do it. Then Strongarm told them of a kind of wood whose surface was coated with sand. He told of awls and spindles that were made of this wood and used to bore holes through teeth and claws. Such wood as this could not always be found, so people used other stems. They tried to find something that was hard enough to bore the teeth and claws. Sometimes they used sand with a spindle of wood. At other times, they fastened a hard flint point at the end of a wooden spindle. When they used the sand in boring, 
they no longer twirled the spindle on their thighs. They could not use the sand unless they held the spindle upright. Strongarm showed them how it was done, and all the people tried it. It was hard work for one person to twirl the spindle steadily. So they began to twirl in an easier way which they had learned when they were young. Strong arm and sharp eyes worked together, and the others worked in the same way. When strong arm's hands were near the foot of the spindle, sharp eyes' hands were near the top. As sharp eyes' hands began to move down the spindle, strong arm began again to twirl at the top. Sometimes they were awkward in moving their hands. Then the spindle did not work so well, so they tried to keep the same time with their hands. They worked together best when they sang as they worked, and the singing kept them from getting tired. Once when they stopped to look at their work, Strongarm picked up a strap that was on the ground. He carelessly wound it once around the spindle, keeping hold of one end of the strap. Then Sharp Eyes picked up the other end of the strap, and Strongarm jerked the end that he held. They did this a few minutes just in play, but at last they began to do it in earnest. Strongarm placed the end of the spindle in the shallow hole that he had made in the saber tooth. Then he and Sharp Eyes began to twirl the spindle with the strap, but there was nothing to keep the spindle from falling, so they tried to hold it with a piece of wood. They made a shallow hole in the wood to fit the top of the spindle. Then while Strongarm and Sharp Eyes pulled the strap, a boy held the spindle in place. Soon the spindle was working steadily, and the hole was becoming deeper and deeper. When they had bored a hole halfway through the tooth, they began to bore from the opposite side. All the cavemen came up to see them work. As soon as the hole was made, Strongarm took a cord of braided sinew and hung the saber tooth at his side. After that, he always wore the trophy. Sometimes he used it for a knife and sometimes for a saw. Everyone who saw this rare trophy knew that Strongarm was a brave man. Things to do. Make a collection of things that you can use for awls. Find something that will do for the spindle of a drill. Show how to drill a hole by twirling the spindle or awl on the thigh. Show how one person can twirl an upright spindle. Show how two persons can twirl an upright spindle with their hands. Show how they can do it with a strap. Can you think why stones are sometimes bound to the shaft of a drill? Look at the picture of the bow drill and see if you can make one. Draw a picture of the cavemen working upon their trophies. Chapter 9 Things to Think About Think of as many tools and weapons as you can that the cavemen found ready to use. What could they find to make into tools and weapons? Why did they not use large boards and metals? Why did they put handles on their tools and weapons? Think of as many ways as you can of fastening handles to tools and weapons. Making new weapons. The cavemen liked their new home. They were able to work better when they were warm than when they were shivering with the cold. They found more time to improve their tools and weapons. One day, they began to make weapons of the bones they found in the cave. Many of the bones were good for clubs. Others were good for handles of weapons. After the cavemen had sorted out the bones that they wanted, they went to hunt stones along the margin of the stream. They wanted stones that were good for hammers. So they hunted for smooth, round stones that were hard to break. They wanted other stones for knives, spears, and axes. So they hunted for stones that broke with a sharp edge. They struck the sharp edges with hammer stones to see if they crumbled under a heavy blow. When they found stones that crumbled, they threw them away, but they kept the stones that were tough and strong. When they had chipped off a few large flakes, they carried the rough stones to the cave. There they made them into weapons. They did not chip the hammer stones, but fastened handles to them. Some handles were long bones that were large at the joint. Other handles were made of forked branches. Sharp Eyes found a hammer stone with a groove around the center and fastened a handle to it. He cut a slender branch of a sapling and bent it around the groove. Then he twisted the ends and held them close, while he bound them with rawhide. The cavemen liked this hammer so well that they made other hammers like it. They made long handles for their knife points so that they became real spears. They put handles on the spearheads in many ways. Sometimes they bound the spearhead between the split end of a long stick and covered the binding with pitch. Sometimes they drove the spearhead into the soft part of a large horn. Sometimes they drove it into the pith of a branch. They always tried to bind the handle so that it would stay, for they sometimes got hurt when a handle came off. Things to do. Find stones that will make good hammers. Tell why they are good for hammers. Find stones that are good for knives, axes, and spears. Tell why they are good for such weapons. 
Find bones, horns, or sticks that are good for handles. See if you can put handles on hammers or spears. Notice how handles are put on tools nowadays. Show as many ways as you can of fastening handles to tools and weapons. See if you can find a tool whose handle is fastened in a way that the cavemen did not use. Tell where you can find the best stones for tools and weapons. Why do people not use stones for tools nowadays? Find out what small stones are used for today. How do you use stones? End of section 3. Section 4 of the Early Cavemen. Chapter 10. How the Women Dressed Sabretooth's Skin. Things to Think About. What do you think the women were doing while the men were working on their weapons? What tools and weapons did the women need? Do you think that they made them themselves? While the men worked upon their trophies and weapons, the women too were working. They had gone to the river banks to get stones to make into tools. They were ready to dress old saber skin, so they hunted for stones that would make good scrapers. They shaped the stones by chipping them with hammer stones, but they did not make handles for them. If the rough edges hurt their hands, they wrapped the scraper in a piece of skin. When the scrapers were ready, they found a smooth spot where they stretched out saber skin. Then they made little slits all around the edge and drove little pegs through them. They scraped off thin shavings from the inner side, but they were careful not to spoil the skin by cutting through it. When they had a smooth surface, they rubbed it with fat so as to make it soft. Sometimes they chewed the hard parts to make them soft. When the skin was smooth and soft, they dried it in the sun. Then they took it into the cave. Sabretooth's skin was too large to wear every day, but Strongarm wore it on feast days. Things to do. Show how the women stretched the skin upon the ground. Show how they scraped it and rubbed it with fat. Find a stone or a shell that will make a good scraper. Get a skin at the meat market and see if you can dress it. Name things that you wear that are made of fur. Name things made of fur that men and women wear. Find as many other uses of fur as you can. Where does the fur that we use come from? Ask someone to tell you how it is prepared for use. Can you think why fur is more expensive now than it used to be? Why should we be careful about killing wild animals? Name the things you have that are made of leather. Visit a tannery and ask someone to tell you about it. Draw a picture of women dressing saber skin. Chapter 11. How the Cave Men Made Clothing Things to Think About Why did the cave men need more clothing than the tree dwellers had? Do you know whether they had cloth? What could they use instead of cloth? How do you think they sewed? How many ways do you know of lacing up your shoes? What did the cavemen use instead of scissors? What do you think they used for needles and thread? During the summer, the cavemen did not wear much clothing. They dressed about the same as the tree dwellers. When they were in the cave, they did not need clothing, for it was always warm in the cave. But as winter came on, they were cold when they went out to hunt. Sometimes they tried to keep warm by running, or by swinging their arms. The skins that they wore for trophies also helped them to keep warm. But as it grew colder, they began to wear larger skins. If they could not find a skin that was large enough, they pieced small skins together. Where we would use scissors, they used a stone knife. Where we would use a needle, they used a bone awl. They trimmed off the ragged edges and punched holes in the places they wished to sew. Then they laced them together with sinew thread as you lace up your shoes. They fastened the garment around the shoulder by tying it with strong straps. Sometimes they fastened their garments with buckles. These skin garments covered only part of the body, but they helped the cave men keep warm 
and strong. Things to do. See if you can find things such as the cavemen used to make a dress for your doll. Find as many ways as you can of sewing by using an awl instead of a needle. See if you can find sinew or tough roots and grasses for making thread. Chapter 12. The Fire Clan. Things to think about. Can you think why the cavemen lived in clans instead of in families as we do? How many men do you think lived in the fire clan? How many women? How many children? What could the children do to help their fathers and mothers? How do you think the children played? Ever since the tree dwellers had learned to use fire, there had been a fire clan on the wooded hills. There were many other clans too. Some of them were named after wild animals, and some were named after plants. All the people lived in clans, for it was the best way to live at that time. There were enough men in each clan to protect it from wild beasts. There were enough women to do the household work. There were many children, too. But there was room enough in the cave for all, and they lived as if they were one large family. Each child in the clan was given a name, which was changed when he became full-grown. The name of one of the girls was Bright Eyes. Bright Eyes called every man in the cave her father, and she called every woman her mother. All of the children were her brothers and sisters. She did not have any cousins. She did not have any uncles and aunts. At that time, no one spoke of uncles and aunts. Bright Eyes used to play with her brothers and sisters, and she used to work, too. She tried to do what the grown-up people did. Sometimes the children went with their mothers to hunt for roots and nuts, but sometimes they had to stay at home to take care of the babies. Bright Eyes liked to play with the babies. She would hunt for bright and shining playthings, which she strung on spruce root or a kind of tough grass. Then she would dangle them over the heads of the babies and watch them as they laughed and crowed. Sometimes the girls made rattles of gourds, which the babies played with for a long time. Sometimes they carried the babies on their backs until they got very tired. Then they put them in their skin cradles again and hung them on the branches of a tree. While they rocked the babies in their cradles, they sang them little lullabies. Things to do. Make some playthings for a baby that you know. See if you can make a skin cradle for your doll. End of section 4. Section 5. Chapter 13. How the Cavemen Spent the Winter. Things to Think About. How do you think the cavemen spent the winter? What kind of food do you think they ate? What do you eat in the winter? Why could not the cavemen have as many kinds of food as you have? Do you think you could stand it to go out in the cold dressed as the cavemen were dressed? Perhaps you think that the cavemen spent a dreary winter. It might be dreary for you if you had to spend it that way, but the cavemen knew nothing about such homes as we have. They lived in the very best home that anyone had at the time. That is why they were satisfied. When the weather was pleasant, they went out to hunt, but they never had to go far. The wild animals were not yet afraid of men, and so they did not try to get away. By using their spears and stone axes, the cave men got plenty of meat to eat. But they got so hungry for something green that they ate the green moss that they found in the stomach of the reindeer. Sometimes they ate the inner bark of trees. Sometimes they found nuts in squirrels' nests. But most of the food that they ate was meat. In the coldest weather, they did not have even meat, for it was not safe to hunt in the biting cold. They stayed in the cave for days at a time, without a taste of food. Sometimes they were so hungry that they chewed hard skins, and they even sucked dry bones. But they managed in some way to live through these cold days until the weather became warmer again. Things to do. Think of the coldest 
stormiest day you have ever seen and draw a picture showing how it looked. Tell a story of what bright eyes did during a cold day. Tell a story of what the cavemen did one pleasant day in the winter. Chapter 14. What the cavemen got from the birch trees. Things to think about. Have you ever noticed the bark of a birch tree? Do you know what birch bark is used for? Why is birch bark better to make into baskets and boats than the bark of other trees? Can you think of a way of taking birch bark from a tree without splitting the bark? Have you ever seen bark that has been mended? What do you think the cavemen used birch bark for? Why do you not have the right to peel birch bark from any tree that you see? Are there any birch trees that you do have the right to take bark from? When the snow began to melt, the cavemen were glad, for it was warm enough to leave the cave. They spent their days on the wooded hills, where many birch trees grew. All the cavemen liked to go to these trees. They liked to peel off the silvery white bark that hung from the older trees in strips. They wanted to get the tough inner bark that was under the smooth outer coat. They chewed the inner bark the way you chew gum. Sometimes they bit into the bark with their teeth and sometimes they cut it with a stone knife. Then they peeled it off in strips with their fingers. At first they peeled it carelessly and gave no thought to the width of the strips. But one day, Firekeeper peeled off a wide strip. There were narrow strips for her to eat, so she kept the wide strip for a while. One day, she began to shape it with her hands and to fold in the edges. After trying for a long time, she made it into a basket. She did not cut the bark, but shaped it by making folds in each corner and fastening them with sharp thorns. She gathered winter buds into the basket and carried them home to the cave. In a few days, the thorns fell out, so Firekeeper cut the bark and sewed the folds. But this basket did not last very long. The edges split, and Firekeeper's basket was soon worn out. One morning, she went with the other women to get birch bark for another basket. They had no trouble in cutting the bark and in loosening the edges with their fingers, but as soon as they tried to peel it, the bark began to split. So they tried to press evenly with their fingers against the underside, but still many strips split. Finally, Firekeeper picked up the rib of a deer and pressed it under the loosened edge. Then she carefully pulled the ends of the rib and peeled off a large piece of bark. Then all the women tried to peel bark by using the rib of a deer. They carried the bark that they peeled to the cave and sat down by the fire to make baskets. Nobody was satisfied with Firekeeper's basket, for the corners were rough and the edges split. They found that by cutting into the sides of the bark, they could fold it so as to make smoother corners. So they cut and folded the bark, then sewed the folds with spruce root. Then they hunted for something to bind around the edge so as to strengthen the basket. Some of the women made rims of tough grass and some used willow stems. These were the first rims they had ever made, but the women always put rims on their baskets after that. Things to do. If there is a birch tree growing in your neighborhood, go and see it. Notice whether it is a good shade tree. Does the bark on the young trees hang in strips as it does on the older trees? If you have the right to do so, peel off enough birch bark to make a basket, a boat, or a frame. When you visit a museum, find as many things as you can that are made of birch bark. Find pictures of things that are made of birch bark. Chapter 15. The Flood. Things to think about. When the snow melts in the spring, what happens to the river or stream in your neighborhood? How does the melted snow get to the river? Have you ever heard of rivers that are under the ground? If such a riverbed were dry, what would it be? Have you ever seen a ravine? Is it anything like a cave? If the roof of a cave fell in, what would the cave become? 
If the sides of a ravine became worn down, what would it become? Think of ways in which the cave might be flooded when the snow melts in the spring. Do you know anything about the floods that we have nowadays? Winter was almost gone. The air was getting mild and soft. The snow was beginning to melt and the river was rising. All along the banks, there were mountains of snow and ice. Huge masses of floating ice were carried along by the current. The cavemen were watching the swiftly rising river. They feared that there might be a flood. The children were playing in the melting snow and wading in the water. Sharp Eyes had just come from the ravine. This ravine was usually dry in summer, but in winter it was filled with snow. Now it was a deep, dark stream with black and threatening water. All the ravines were pouring their waters into the river, which was rising rapidly. Where the banks were steep, the river was narrow. There, the water was deep, and large masses of snow and ice were carried along by the strong current. At the drinking place, the banks were low. There, the river was wider, and the current was not so deep and strong. Small masses of snow and ice were carried along by the current, but the larger masses became lodged on the bed of the stream. In this way, the river was forming a dam. All day long, the cave men watched the river, but at night, they went back to the cave. There were dark clouds in the sky, so Firekeeper covered the fire with ashes, and they got ready for the night. All but Firekeeper were soon asleep. As she kept watch that night, there was something that troubled her. It was not the roaring river. It was not the pouring rain. She had heard those sounds before. It was a sound that was new to her, and she wondered what it meant. It seemed to come from deep down in the cave, and it sounded like rumbling water. She did not wish to frighten the clan, so she let them all sleep. She listened again. She still heard the roaring of the river. She still heard the pouring rain. Below it all, she heard the strange muffled sound. It was coming nearer and nearer. She felt water trickling over her bed of moss and leaves. At first, she thought it was the rain. She peered into the darkness but saw nothing. She felt of the running water. It was coming from the cave. Then she saw Strongarm. He quickly roused the people and they hurried out of the cave. A moment more and it would have been too late. The water rushed up from the dark narrow passage and out through the mouth of the cave. There was water everywhere. The frightened cave men ran for the hills. They climbed trees where they stayed throughout the long dark night. When the rays of sun streaked the sky in the east, the cave men were still up in the trees. They looked out over the valley but they scarcely knew the place. All the land except the hills was covered by the flood. All the thickets had disappeared. Only the tops of the trees stood above the water. The river was dammed with snow and ice. The water dashed against the dam, but it could not break its way through. It was forced back. It was overflowing the banks. It was flooding the land. Nobody had breakfast that morning. Nobody had a mouthful to eat all that day. All the cave men watched the flood from the trees. They heard the ice when it began to crack. They heard the roaring of the river as it beat upon the dam. They knew that it was wearing its way through. About midday, there was a loud crash. The cave men then knew that the dam was broken, and they saw the water pour through the dam and sweep everything in its path. Before sunset, the flood was gone. Most of the ice and snow had been swept away. The cave men were glad to come down from the trees, and they hurried to see what had happened to their cave. Things to do. Notice a river or brook after a heavy rain or the melting of the snow. See if you can tell where the current of the river is. Notice the difference in the current in the wide and narrow parts of the river. Find the parts of the valley that would be flooded if the river overflowed its banks. Notice the little holes that are made in the ground by the rain. See if you can find a ravine made by the rain. Model a small river valley showing some of the work of the rain. Change the little potholes so as to make them into caves. Change the caves so as to make them into ravines. Change a ravine so as to make a valley. Tell a story 
of how a pothole became a valley. Show in your sandbox the way the cave was flooded. End of section 5. Section 6 of the Early Cavemen. Chapter 16. What the Cavemen Lost in the Flood. Things to think about. Do you think that the cavemen can live in their cave when they go back? What do you think they lost in the flood? What did the cavemen prize most of all? Can you tell why they thought the fire was alive? The cavemen were anxious about their home, so they hastened to the cave. Their bare feet left clear tracks in the layer of fine mud, but they were too anxious about the fire to think of such things as tracks in the mud. They did not know much about the fire or the flood, but they thought that they both were alive. They feared that the fire had been driven away, yet they hoped to find a few live coals that they could kindle into a flame. But not even a stone was left on the spot to mark the place where the fireplace had been. Everything had been swept away by the flood. Firekeepers searched in vain for a spark. When at last she knew that the fire was gone, she wrung her hands and wailed. The people joined in Firekeeper's cries until Strongarm comforted them. Strongarm hoped that their neighbors still had fire and sent Sharp Eyes to find out. Then he crept through the mouth of the cave to see what had happened there. The water had gone down in the large cavern, but it was still rumbling below. The floor of the cave was wet and slippery and covered with fine mud. Slowly, Strongarm groped his way through the dark and damp cavern. He wanted to find Sabretooth's skin. He moved his hands over the floor of the cave and into each corner and crevice, but no trace of the skin could he find. Then the cavemen hunted for their weapons, but they too had been carried away. The cavemen had lost all they had in the flood. When they saw Sharp Eyes coming, they went to meet him, but he brought them no good news. There was no more fire on the wooded hills. There was sorrow everywhere. Things to do. Show what the cavemen did when they went back to the cave. Draw a picture of them. Tell a story of what you think happened at one of the other caves. Chapter 17, The Council. Things to think about. How do you think the cavemen will get fire? Where can fire be found without making it? If the cavemen had seen a place where there were natural fires, do you think they would remember where it was? What do you think happened to the wild animals during the flood? The cave was too damp to live in for several days after the flood. The cavemen camped at its mouth and waited for it to dry. Not an animal came near them during that time. Many animals had been drowned in the flood. Many more had escaped to higher lands. The cavemen were safe for a time, but they had to live on bark and roots. They knew that the animals would return, so they began to make new weapons. It was well that they made them as soon as they did, for the animals soon came back. At first, the animals kept away from the cave, but when they no longer saw the fire, they began to come up nearer. Then the cavemen were frightened. Some of them wanted to leave the cave and live as the tree dwellers had lived. But Strongarm wanted to stay in the cave and to keep all the people in the clan together. He knew that they could not keep together unless they had fire again. So he talked with the bravest men and they decided to hold a council. Messengers were sent to call all the people to a meeting at the Fire Clan's cave. By midday, they had assembled. They had not held many councils. They were not used to obeying. At first, there was great confusion and loud, boisterous talking. Each had a plan of his own. But soon, they became more quiet and began to listen to the wisest men. All eyes were soon turned toward an old man who had been their mightiest hunter. But now he was getting old and his strength was beginning to fail. The old man arose in the silence and thus he spoke to his people. Many years have we lived on these hillsides. Our fathers lived here before us. They lived many years without fire. They lived and they worked and they waited. 
the fire god came among them. He gave them burning branches. He told them they were his children. He asked them to feed him daily. We have always tried to obey him. We have always fed him daily. He has given us his protection. But the water god was angry. He came in all his fury. He drove us from our dwelling. He rushed upon our fire god. He drove him far away. Now the water god has gone. Our fire god may return. He may be near us now. We must search till we surely find him. We must bring him home again. For a moment, the old man was silent. He waited for someone to speak. At last, Strongarm asked the old man if he knew where the fire god now lived. To this, the old man responded, That no one knows truly. I have heard that he dwells in the dry wood, but he seems not to hear our voices. I have heard that he dwells in the mountains. Our fathers have been to the mountains. They were hunting the musk sheep and the marmot. One night, they were tired and hungry. They were seeking a place of refuge, and they saw a light in the distance. They ran to it, and they found the flaming fire. It gave them its protection. I have heard there are dark chasms. I have heard that the fire springs from them. I think I can find these mountains, but my steps are getting feeble. I need the help of a young man who will go on this long, hard journey. Who will go on this long, hard journey? Then Sharp Eyes stepped forward and said that he would go with the old man. Everybody knew that Sharp Eyes was a brave young man, and so it was agreed that he should be the one to go. Things to do. Think of the old man as he talked to the people. Think of Sharp Eyes as he stepped forward and said that he would go. Draw one of these pictures. Play holding a council. Chapter 18. The Way to the Fire Country Things to Think About When you go traveling, where do you stay at night? Where do you think the old man and sharp eyes stayed? Where do you get food when you travel? Where would the cavemen get food? What new clothing do you need before you go? What clothing do you think the cavemen needed to get ready to go? Did the cavemen need anything that you do not need? Why? The cavemen knew that the fire country was far away from the wooded hills. They knew that the journey was a dangerous one and that the old man and sharp eyes might never return. So they did all they could to help them prepare for the journey. Much of the way was rocky and they knew their bare feet would blister. So they tried to make something to protect their feet. They had not yet learned to make shoes and stockings, but they had often bound grass about their feet. They had even learned to make braided grass sandals. They braided the grass, then sewed it. Braided grass sandals were good while they lasted, but they soon wore out. So they made new sandals of thick, tough skin. Part of the way was through thorny thickets, so they needed something to protect their legs. They had not yet learned to make trousers or leggings, but they cut strips of skin to wind around their legs. Skins that were worn as clothing by day served as blankets by night. They dared not burden themselves with food, but trusted to killing game on the way. So they were careful to take their best spears and axes. They knew that their weapons might break, so they took tools and straps to mend them. Everybody helped the old man and Sharp Eyes. Everybody arose early the morning they went away. Sharp Eyes and the old man put on their new clothing and the women brought them food to eat. As the old man slung a hollow gourd over his shoulder, Firekeeper came up and gave him a skin bag. Nobody knew what the bag was for until Firekeeper showed them that it would hold water. The old man was glad to take it and leave the hollow gourd at home. Then the old man and Sharp Eyes took leave of their kinfolk and started out on the long journey. Things to do. Make a pair of sandals of something that you can find growing out of doors. Draw a picture of the cavemen helping the old man and sharp eyes get ready. End of section 6. Section 7. Chapter 19. How Firekeeper Made the Skin Water Bag. 
Things to think about. How do you think Firekeeper made the skin water bag? Where did the cavemen get water? When did they need to carry water? Name as many things as you can that they could use for carrying water before they learned to make water vessels. What do we use to carry water? Where does the water that we drink come from? The cavemen watched the old man in sharp eyes until they passed out of sight. Then the men went out on the hills, while the women and children dug roots near the cave. After a while, they climbed a large oak tree and sat on its strong, spreading branches. Then Bright Eyes asked Firekeeper about the bag, and how she happened to make it. All the children liked to hear Firekeeper talk. She often told them of the brave deeds of their fathers. She often showed them how to make useful things that their mothers knew how to make. They all wanted to hear her now, so they tried to get close beside her. She told them of Sharp Tooth and the way she got water by drinking it from the stream. Then she told how Bodo got fire, and how people began to live around the fireplace. As soon as people learned to work together, they often went far away from the stream. When the woman went burying far from the river, they became thirsty before they got home. One day, they found water in a hollow gourd that had been filled by the rain. They took the gourd with them when they went home and used it for carrying water. Afterward, they learned to hollow out gourds and use them for water vessels. Sometimes. They left part of the vine on the gourd and used the vine for a carrying strap. When they pulled the gourd off from the vine, they had to make a strap for the gourd. Sometimes the gourd broke and spilled the water, so they wove a coarse netting of wild vines and covered it with that. All the children had seen gourd water vessels and had used them many times. Bright Eyes had learned to make the netting. So Firekeeper did not stop to show how it was made. All were anxious to hear about the skin bag, so Firekeeper went on with her story. She told them that she had been thinking of the dry, rocky country for several days. She knew that the men must pass through it, and she feared they would die of thirst. She was afraid to trust the gourd water vessel at such a time as this. She wished the gourd were as strong as skin. Then she wondered if she could make a skin bag. The next day, when she was skinning a hyena, she happened to think of a way to do it. Instead of cutting the skin straight down the breast line, she tried another way. After cutting off the feet and the head, she loosened the skin and slipped it off almost whole. She scraped it. And softened it with fat, and tied up the legs with straps. Then she fastened a strap to the bag. It was finished just in time for the men to take it with them. The story was now ended, so the women and children got down from the tree, and started back to the cave. Things to do. Think of Firekeeper and the children as they sat in the tree. Draw a picture of them. Find as many things as you can that the caveman might have used to carry water. Make a water vessel of a gourd, a melon, or something that you can find. Perhaps you can ornament your water vessel. Draw a picture of the skin water bag. Chapter twenty: Things to think about. What do you think the caveman will do while the old man and sharp eyes are gone? How will they keep the animals out of the cave? Chapter Twenty: Why Firekeeper Made a Door. The day after the old man and Sharp Eyes went away, a cave bear came up toward the cave. The woman sent the children into the cave and grasped their weapons to help the men. The bear turned and went away, but the cavemen were afraid that he would come back. They could defend themselves at the mouth of the cave, but.
but they had to go out to get something to eat. They were afraid to leave the children alone, for fear the cave bear might get them. At last, they thought of shutting them up in the cave. They had never seen nor heard of a door, but they knew how to heap up piles of stones. So they rolled up large stones and piled them up until part of the entrance was blocked. They did not want to wall up the whole mouth, for the stones were too heavy to move every day. But they wanted to close the mouth of the cave so as to keep the cave bear out. Everybody tried to find a way to do it, and at last Firekeeper got an idea for a door. Perhaps you would not call what she made a door, but it was a good door for that time. Firekeeper made it of tough branches. She stuck several large branches into the ground and wove smaller ones among them. When the door was finished, the woman pulled up the large branches and carried the wicker work door to the cave. They set it between the stones so as to close the mouth. After that, they shut the children in the cave when they went out to hunt. But the cave bear still prowled around. When the woman came home from the woods one day, the cave bear was at the door. They rushed upon him with their knives and spears. They were torn and bruised by the cave bear, but he never troubled them any more. Things to do If you have a playhouse, Try to make a wicker work door for it. Tell a story of what the children did when they saw the cave bear through the holes in the door. Model a cave bear in clay. Chapter 21. Things to think about. Can you think what kind of a place the fire country is? Can you tell where we get oil and gas to burn? If a natural oil well should take fire, what would happen? Have you ever seen a volcano? Chapter 21 The Stranger That Came Toward the Cave Many days passed, and each day the caveman missed the fire more and more. They missed the old man in sharp eyes. They hoped they would soon come home. But as the days went by, and they did not come, the cavemen feared they would never return. One day, about sunset, they went into the cave. As Firekeeper was fastening the door of the cave, she saw a stranger coming. She called the others to look. They hoped they would see their friends, but this man seemed a stranger. He was hardly able to walk. His garments were torn and tattered. His limbs were bruised and bleeding. As the caveman looked in silence, he sank exhausted to the ground. Then the caveman gathered around him. They raised him up and looked into his face. They could scarcely believe what they saw. It was Sharp Eyes. No wonder they did not know him. He had been one of their bravest hunters. He had left them young and happy. But now he looked old and haggard. He seemed to be crushed with sorrow. They carried him into the cave and bathed his tired feet. They dressed his wounds. At last he moved, and they spoke to him. They asked about the old man. They asked if he had found fire. But Sharp Eyes could not answer. He fell into a deep sleep, and he was still sleeping long after the morning sun arose. Things to do Show how the cavemen acted when they saw the stranger coming toward the cave. Show how they helped Sharp Eyes to the cave. Draw a picture showing the part that you like best. End of Section 7 Section 8 Chapter 22 the journey to the fire country things to think about what do you think the cavemen will do while sharp eyes is sleeping why will everybody on the wooded hills want to hear his story 
What do you think his story will be? Before sunrise, Strongarm had sent word to all the people on the hills that Sharp Eyes had returned. He told them to meet at the Fire Clan's cave. All were anxious to hear Sharp Eyes' story. Some of the cavemen still hoped that the old man would come with fire, but others feared he would never return. About noon, Sharp Eyes awoke. The woman brought him water and meat. When he had eaten, all the cavemen were there. They gathered around Sharp Eyes in silence and grew sad as they looked in his face. At length, Sharp Eyes roused up as if he were waking from a dream. He recalled the morning that he and the old man had started out on their journey. He spoke of the hope that filled their hearts. He told of the long and difficult way and of the trouble they had in crossing the mountains. At last, they reached the dry, rocky country where the old man led the way. He knew where to look for the cool mountain springs where they drank and filled the water bag. They journeyed onward many a day, climbing steep and rocky heights. At last, they saw flames of fire in the distance. They eagerly hastened to their journey's end. They were tired and hungry when they reached the fire country, but their hearts were filled with joy. They were glad to be near the fire god once more. They watched the fire dart up toward the sky. It seemed to come from deep, dark chasms. They stayed in the fire country several days. After mending their weapons, they hunted a while. They cooked their meat in the flaming fire. They slept on the ground beside the fire. When they were rested, they started home. They lighted some punk and put it in their tool bag. Then they lighted their torches and set out on their homeward way. As they traveled, they talked of their friends. Their hearts were glad, for they hoped to bring happiness to all the people on the wooded hills. Things to do Play that you are the caveman, and let someone tell a sharp-eyed story while the others listen to it. See if you can find some punk. Why do you think that the men put punk in their tool bag? Tell all that you know about the fire country. Draw a picture of it. Chapter 23 Things to Think About What do you think had become of the old man? How do you think the caveman will get fire? Chapter 23 The Return from the Fire Country While Sharp Eyes was talking, he seemed to be hopeful. But now his head fell, and he seemed unwilling to speak. Strongarm urged him to go on. At length he continued the story, but his voice was filled with sadness. He told how the first few days of the journey everything went well. They stopped for nothing but food and sleep, for they were anxious to get home. No animal disturbed them on their way as long as they had fire. But one day... The sky grew dark. A heavy rainstorm beat down upon them and put out the fire they carried. But since they had burning punk in the bag, they thought they could light their torches again. They waited for the rain to cease. Then they took the punk from the bag and tried to light their torches. But the wood was damp, and it was hard work to fan the spark into a flame. They worked so busily that they thought of nothing except the fire. They did not see a big-nosed rhinoceros that was watching them from among the trees. He was almost upon them before they thought of danger. Then they quickly sprang for the tree, but the old man lost his hold. He fell and was trampled by the monstrous beast. The rhinoceros tore up the ground with his horns until he had spent his rage. Then he tramped off through the woods. Sharp Eyes paused again. His voice choked so that he could scarcely speak. At length, he told how he slipped down from the tree 
and found the old man dying. He carried him out to a grassy spot where the old man died. Sharp Eyes covered his body with leaves and raised a mound of stones above it. Then he went back to the tree and searched for the lighted punk. But there was no punk to be found. The rhinoceros had trampled it under his feet. In vain, Sharp Eyes tried to find a spark. When at last he knew that the fire was all gone, he decided to go back to the fire country. He went as far as the dry, rocky country where he was chased by a pack of wolves. He barely escaped to a neighboring tree where the wolves kept him treed for a day. When the wolves went away, he was nearly starved. He was tired and discouraged, too. His clothing was torn and his weapons were lost, so he dared not cross the dry country again. He turned his face toward home once more, though he scarcely hoped to make the journey. He had many narrow escapes, but he did not wish to talk about them. For a few moments, there was a deep silence. Then the cavemen wept. They mourned for the old man. They mourned for the loss of fire. They had lost all hope. They were filled with despair. Things to do Tell the story that Sharp Eyes told to the cavemen. Draw a picture of Sharp Eyes as he was telling the story. Think of Sharp Eyes as he was chased and treed by a pack of wolves. Draw a picture of him when the wolves were keeping him in the tree. Model the fire country in one end of your sandbox and the home of the fire clan in the other. Model the places that Sharp Eyes and the old man traveled across in going to the fire country. Show the places where you think they found trails. Tell how you think the trails were made and what they were used for. Chapter 24 Things to Think About What do we burn in our fires? How do we light the different fires that we have? What do we burn for light? How do we light our lights? Find out how your grandfather and grandmother used to light their fires. Find out what they used for lights and how they took care of them. Do you know how the Eskimo used to get fire? Chapter 24 Strongarm Makes a Great Discovery When the cavemen had heard Sharp Eye's story, they went back to their caves. The fire clan was left alone again. Strongarm spoke of going to the fire country himself, but it did not seem best to leave the people just then. Some of the men had already left the cave and gone to live as the tree dwellers lived. Strongarm was trying to keep the rest of them together. He feared that he would not be able to do it unless he could get fire. For several days after that, the cavemen thought that Strongarm seemed queer. Wherever he went, he carried the drill that he used in boring holes. Sometimes he carried a bundle of sticks under his arm. Sometimes he worked with all these things in a corner of the cave. None of the cavemen knew what he was doing, but they heard him mumbling to himself. Once they saw him start up quickly and go away from the cave. Nobody knew where he went, and nobody knew what he did. Strongarm was very sad. His heart was sore for his people, for they were in great distress. He believed that the fire god dwelt in the wood, and he was trying to persuade him to come out. He had noticed that the drill became warm by twirling when he used it for boring holes. So now he made a drill of hard wood and twirled it on a piece of softer wood. As he twirled the stick, he prayed to the fire god. He asked him to come and help the cavemen. When he went away from the cave that day, he went to find Tinder. When he came back that night, he was very happy, for he had a burning torch in his hand. Things to do 
Show how strong arm acted when he was twirling sticks. Draw the picture. Find some sticks that you can use in making fire. Put them in a place where they will dry. Look at the pictures on pages forty-five, forty-eight, and forty-nine. What is the difference between a drill for boring holes and a fire drill? End of section eight. Section nine of the early cavemen. Chapter twenty-five: How the cavemen received strongarm. Things to think about. What do you think the cavemen did when they saw Strongarm coming with fire? Do you think he told them how he got it? Did you ever have a secret? What kind of things do you wish to keep secret? Can you think why Strongarm might wish to keep his discovery a secret? How glad all the cavemen were when they saw Strongarm. Coming with fire, they ran out to meet him and shouted for joy. Firekeeper lighted a fire, and the woman brought branches to make it blaze. The wild animals sniffed it and ran away. The cavemen joined hands and danced around the fire. They danced until they could dance no more, and then sat down on the ground to rest. They asked where Strongarm found the fire. But he did not tell them then. Some of the cavemen were very selfish; they cared more for themselves than they did for the clan. Some of the men had already left; others were thinking of going away. Strongarm wanted to teach them to help one another, so he told them only part of the truth. He said nothing about the fire drill, but he told them about his prayer. He said that the fire god came when he called him. At this, the cavemen were filled with fear. They looked upon Strongarm in wonder. After that, they treated him with great respect. When they needed a chief, he led them. He was the greatest man of the time. Things to do: show how the cavemen rejoiced when Strongarm came with his burning torch. Draw the picture. Show what you think they did when they were told that the fire god came at Strongarm's command. Chapter twenty-six: Things to think about. Do you know why we have Thanksgiving Day? How will the cavemen show that they were thankful? Chapter twenty-six: The Thanksgiving Feast. How thankful the cavemen were to have fire again! They wanted the fire god to know it. They wanted their neighbors to have fire too. So they sent a messenger with a firebrand to invite them to a feast. As the messenger neared the cave where they dwelt, he heard the people wailing. He hurried on with the glad tidings. When the people saw him. They ran to meet him and lighted firebrands of their own. Their sadness was turned to joy. They told the messenger that their bravest man had been killed that very day. He had been carried away by a tiger while standing near the cave. They feared that the tiger would return and that they all would be killed. But now that they had fire again, they began to feel more safe. The messenger told them what Strongarm had done, while they stared with open mouth and eyes. When the messenger invited them to the feast, they quickly made ready to start. The feast was ready when they reached the cave. The cavemen were filled with joy. They gathered around the fireplace. Everybody was silent while Strongarm gave some of the choicest meat as an offering to the fire god. Then they all began to eat. They feasted and talked a long time. They shouted praises to the fire god. They were thankful to have him with them again. All the people were happy once more. Things to do: play some game 
where you all join hands and dance around in a circle. Draw a picture of it. How many ring games do you know how to play? Play that you are having a Thanksgiving feast. Chapter twenty seven. Things to think about. Did you ever go out in the woods in the spring to find something to eat? Have you ever tasted the bark of any trees? If there are any spruce trees near you, find out what they are good for. Chapter twenty seven. What the woman got from the spruce trees. All the snow was now gone from the wooded hills. The people were glad, for they were tired of the long, cold winter. They were hungry for fresh green leaves and berries. One day, Firekeeper took a torch and started out over the hills to see what she could find to eat. She found winter greens. With red berries half hidden among the dry oak leaves, she ate some and gathered a handful. Then she passed on over the hills. The sap of the spruce trees was beginning to flow, and had hardened in places upon the trunks. Firekeeper bit off a lump and chewed it until she made it into gum. Then she bit off other lumps and even bit into the inner bark. She liked the taste of the bark, so she peeled off large pieces and ate them. Then she gave a shrill call and listened until she heard a call from the cave. In a moment, she called again. Again, the answer came, but this time the voices were nearer. Then Firekeeper knew that the woman and children were coming. Soon she heard their calls again, and again she called to them. This happened several times, each time the voices sounding nearer. In this way, Firekeeper helped the woman to find the way to the spot. She kept watch until they came in sight. There were women carrying flaming torches and others with babies strapped to their backs. Children followed close to their mothers' heels or ran along beside them. The cradles were hung on the branches of the trees. While the women were getting a taste of the bark, Firekeeper was hunting slender twigs for baskets. All the women soon joined Firekeeper in the work. They broke off slender branches from the spruce trees and trimmed them and laid them in bundles. Then they dug spruce roots with sharp digging sticks. After eating all the bark that they wished, they played with the children among the trees. The mothers strapped bundles on the little girls' backs, but took the larger bundles themselves. They followed the river path on their way home and stopped when they came to the drinking place. After drinking the fresh, cool water, they dug shallow holes near the edge of the stream. They dug little troughs from these holes so that the water of the river could flow in. Then they put the spruce branches into these holes and left them there to soak. When they reached the cave that night, they were tired and hungry too. But the men soon came with plenty of meat, and soon they were all eating and resting around the open fire. Things to do. Go out to some uncultivated spot and see if you can find twigs or branches that can be made into baskets. See if you can peel the bark from the stems. Soak some twigs in water and see how much easier they will bend than dry twigs do. See if you can find hardened sap on a spruce tree. Make it into gum. Show how Firekeeper and the woman called back and forth. End of section nine. Section ten of the early cavemen. Chapter twenty-eight: How the woman made splints for baskets. Things to think about. What have you seen that is made of splints of wood? Find branches that can be made into splints. 
See if you can do anything to the wood to make it split more easily. How many splints do you think the woman split the stems into at first? How could they make flat splints? How could they make splints that were the same width? After the spruce branches had soaked a few days, the woman brought them to the cave. While the children played with sticks and stones, their mothers made some splints. They peeled off the bark with their teeth and nails and split one end of the stem. Then they held one piece with their teeth and pulled the other two pieces with their hands. The splints that they made in this way were neither round nor flat. They had three sharp corners. Two of these corners were hard and tough, but one was soft and pithy. So they bit the pithy corner and pulled off a long strand of pith. This left a thick splint that was nearly flat. The woman found that it was hard work to split the larger stems. They were about to give it up when Firekeeper found a large stem whose layers of wood peeled easily. So they all tried to find such stems. It was not long before they found that the stems that peeled the most easily were the ones that the children had pounded. So they all picked up hammer stones. And pounded the large stems. At first, each hammered to suit herself, but soon they learned to strike together. It was easier for them all when they worked in the same time. People who have made splints for baskets since then have worked in the same time. Sometimes they keep time by calls, and sometimes they use rhymes. Perhaps you have heard a bark beater's rhyme. Or have a rhyme yourself. This rhyme is used by children nowadays when they try to beat in the same time. Sip, sap, say. Sip, sap, say. Lig in a nettle bed while May Day. Things to do. Gather tough branches of trees or shrubs that you have a right to use. See if you can make them into splints for baskets. Find a way of making brittle wood more tough. Beat the stems with hammer stones so as to loosen the layers of wood. Keep track of a tree or a shrub in your neighborhood during the year, and find out the best time of the year to gather its branches for baskets. Chapter twenty-nine: Things to think about. What do you think would be the easiest way for the woman to weave the splints into baskets? What kind of baskets do they need? Would they be apt to make them all in the same way? Have you ever seen a basket that will hold water? If a basket was almost watertight, how could you make it watertight? Chapter twenty-nine: How the woman wove splints. When the splints were made, the woman began to weave them into baskets. Some of the splints were wide, and some of them were narrow. Some of them were thin, and some of them were thick. But the woman did not mind this. At first, they wove them by interlacing, as Sharptooth had woven the basket of rushes. But since the strands were not all the same width, the weaving did not look the same. After a while, they began to sort the splints. They put the wide splints into one pile, and the narrow ones into another. Then they wove the wide splints in open work and made baskets for carrying roots and leaves. They wanted smaller baskets for carrying berries, so they used the narrow splints. They wove these splints in close work so that the berries would not drop out. Some of the women wanted still closer weaving, so they pressed the splints down with their fingers. When their fingers became sore from pressing hard, they used a long bone. By driving the splints with a long bone, the weaving was made firm and strong. Some of the baskets they made in this way were found to be watertight, so they sometimes used them for carrying water. When the baskets became very dry, the wood shrank. And this made little holes in the baskets. 
but the woman soon learned to stop the leak by mending the baskets with pitch. Things to do: find baskets that are woven in open work. Find baskets that are woven in close work. See if you can find a watertight basket. Draw a picture of the woman weaving baskets. Weave a basket or a mat in close work. Use a stick and drive the woof strands close together. Chapter thirty: Things to think about. Look at all the uncolored baskets that you have a chance to see, and select the basket that you think is the best. Why do you think it is the best? What is it used for? How is it woven? Look at the baskets that are made of two or more colors and select the one that you think is the best. Why do you think it is best? How do you think the colors were made? Can you tell how the pattern is woven in this basket? Can you think of any colors that the cavemen could use in their weaving before they learned to color reeds and splints? Can you think how they might have found a way to stain their baskets? Do you ever get stains in your clothing? What stains will wash out most easily? What stains do not come out easily? Which ones would you like to use to stain a basket? Do we have anything in our houses that we stain on purpose? What do we use to stain with? Have you ever seen colored earth? Can you think what it is used for? Why do you think the cavemen like to find colored earth? Where do you put water to boil it? Why did the cavemen learn to roast food before they learned to boil it? Did you ever see anybody make dyes? Do you think people could make dyes before they learned to boil water? Can you think of ways in which the cavemen might have changed the color of grasses, splints, and reeds before they learned how to boil water and to make such dyes as we use today? Why do you think they would wish to color them? Chapter Thirty: How the Women Colored Their Baskets. The women took a great deal of pains in weaving baskets. They wove the ends in carefully. So they would not pull out. They bound the rims on neatly, so as to make the baskets strong. But for a long time, they did not try to ornament their baskets. They wove their baskets so carefully that they were beautiful without ornaments. At first, they wove each woof strand under and over each strand of the warp. Then they began to weave each woof strand over one and under two. This made such a pretty pattern that they tried other ways of weaving. They soon learned to use strands of different sizes, and after a while, they learned how to color them. But they could not make such dyes as we have until they learned to boil water. Sometimes they found bright colored leaves and feathers and wove them with the splints and reeds. Sometimes they stained the finished basket with the juices of fruits and berries. Sometimes they painted patterns on it with paint that they made of colored earth. Then they learned to dye the splints and reeds in a very simple way. They soaked them in water before they used them, so as to make them pliable. They found that willow stems that were soaked in water were colored light brown by the bark of the stem. Splints buried in the leaf mold of the brooks and marshes were colored a dark brown. When charcoal was mixed with the rich leaf mold, the splints were colored black. Green grass became white when soaked in water, and yellow if soaked for a longer time. The woman used these and other ways of getting pretty colors. Then they worked the colors into pretty patterns, many of which we use today. Things to do: weave uncolored splints or reeds. So as to make different patterns, find a fruit that will make a durable stain, and stain some splints for a basket, or make a pattern by staining on an uncolored basket. See if you can find how to take fruit stains out of clothing. 
If you can find colored earth, see if you can make some paint to use in ornamenting your baskets. Try different ways of changing the color of grasses, splints, and reeds by soaking them in water or burying them in different kinds of soil. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Early Cavemen. Chapter 31. How the Cavemen Carried Their Burdens. Things to Think About. How do you carry the things that you bring to school? How is the food that you eat brought to you? How is your clothing carried to you? Do you know how the material that your house is made of was brought to the spot? How does the farmer carry oats to his horses? How does he carry milk to the calves? How does he carry hay from the field to the barn? How does he carry hay from the mow to the manger? What things do you carry in your hands? What do you carry in baskets? What do you carry in trays? What other things do you use in carrying? How do you think the cavemen would carry an animal that they had killed to the cave? Do you think they would try to bring the whole carcass home? What things would they carry in baskets? Why did they need handles for their baskets? Think of as many ways as you can that the cavemen might have carried things. The cavemen used the baskets they made for carrying roots and berries. It was easier to carry them in baskets than to carry them in their hands. But it took one hand to hold the basket and they often needed to have both hands free. So they learned to carry baskets on their heads and shoulders. When the cavemen jumped in time of danger, they were apt to lose their load. So they learned to make handles for their baskets and to carry them with strong straps. When they rested the strap upon the forehead, it was a head strap. When the basket was heavy, the head strap pressed hard against the forehead and cut through the skin. So they made little pads to protect their foreheads. At first these pads were bunches of grass or pieces of soft skin, but the woman soon braided carrying straps that had pads for the forehead. Sometimes they let the strap rest on the shoulders, then it was a shoulder strap. When they let it rest upon the breast, it was a breast strap. All the cavemen learned to use straps so, and many people still carry things in that way. Things to do Play carrying something on the head. The one who can carry the longest without dropping his burden wins the game. Look at the handles of all the baskets you can find and see if you can tell how they are used. Can you think of any better way of carrying these baskets? Make a handle for a basket. Make a carrying strap and show how to use it for a head strap. Show how to use it for a shoulder strap and a breast strap. Draw a picture of a woman carrying a basket. Model in clay a caveman who is carrying a wild pig on his back. Chapter 32 Things to Think About Why would the cavemen not be so likely to attack a mammoth as a cave bear? Why would they want to kill a mammoth? Do you think the mammoth would be afraid of the cavemen's weapons? What was the mammoth afraid of? Chapter 32 A Mammoth Hunt One day, Strong Arm saw a herd of mammoths grazing near the edge of a cliff. He had often wished to capture a mammoth, but had never had such a chance before. He blew his bone whistle. All who heard it called to others farther away. Soon, all the men from the wooded hills came running to the spot. They wanted to attack the mammoths, but Strong Arm would not let them. He knew that their weapons were not strong enough, so he showed them what to do. Then 
they all hunted for good sticks to make into torches. When the torches were made, the cavemen formed a line from one edge of the cliff to the other. They crept up through the low bushes until they were only a few steps from the herd. The mammoths did not see the men until Strongarm gave the signal to charge. Then they started to run. But the cavemen chased them, waving their torches in the air. The cavemen pressed close after the mammoths until they came to the edge of the cliff. They filled the air with their loud cries. When the mammoths saw the trap they were in, they turned and faced the men. One mammoth was crowded over the edge of the cliff. When the cavemen saw the mammoth fall, they broke the line and let the herd escape. Then they hurried down by a well-known path to the spot where the mammoth lay. He had been killed by the fall. The cavemen seldom got such a large creature as the mammoth. Everybody was glad, so Strongarm sent messengers to all the caves to call the women and children to a feast. Things to do Show how the cavemen hunted the mammoth. Model a mammoth in clay. When you go to a museum, inquire if there is a skeleton of a mammoth there. Chapter 33 Things to think about. How do you think the mammoth will be divided? How will the meat that is left after the feast be carried? Do you know what kind of a coat the mammoth has? How long do you think its tusks are? Can you think how we have learned about this animal that lived such a long time ago? Chapter 33 how the cavemen divided the mammoth. When the women heard what the men had done, they danced and shouted their praises. Then they all prepared for the feast. You know how the cavemen acted at a feast. They all ate as much as they could. Then the older men and women began to tell stories. All gathered around to hear the stories, and then they joined in a hunting dance. They feasted and danced for several days. Even then, there was plenty of meat. There were trophies, too, for the bravest men. All the cavemen admired the mammoth's tusks, and they tried to loosen them with their hammers. The tusks belonged to Strongarm, but others shared in the meat and the bones. When the feast was over, Firekeeper divided the meat. The women loaded it upon their backs or dragged it on the ground. They carried the tusks with strong straps which hung down from their shoulders. The women and children carried the burdens while the men protected them on the way. All the cavemen divided their work in this way. They all knew they were safest when the men were ready to fight. If the men had carried the burdens, all the people might have been killed. Things to do Show how the woman and children danced and shouted the praises of the cavemen. Draw a picture of them. Name animals that have tusks. What do they use their tusks for? Show how the long line of cavemen looked when they were traveling on their way home. Draw a picture of them. End of section 11 Section 12 of The Early Cavemen Chapter 34 Strongarm Tells Firekeeper His Secret Things to Think About Do you think Strongarm will ever tell anyone how he got fire? Why do you think people used to be so careful of the fire? Do you know of any people who make fire by twirling sticks? Do you think that you can make fire by using a fire drill? Can you think of a name for the wood that is ground up as the spindle of the fire drill is twirled? Do you ever gather kindling to start a fire? Have you ever seen or heard of tinder? 
Several years had passed by since Strongarm made fire. The cavemen had never prospered so before. Strongarm was their wisest man, and they all obeyed him in time of danger. Cavemen came from far and near to see him and to hear what he said. He had kept his secret all these years, but now he knew that it was time to tell it. He knew that he was growing old, and that someone else must share the secret. So one day he called Firekeeper to a fallen tree that had lain near the cave for many years. Its wood had become very dry, and parts of it were beginning to decay. It was by this log that he told his secret. It was here that he showed Firekeeper how to make fire. He took a dry stick for a spindle and twirled it on the dry log. As he twirled, he prayed to the fire god. He worked until he got fire. Then he let Firekeeper twirl the sticks until she got a spark. The first time she tried it, she could not get fire. So Strongarm showed her how to make a groove in the log where the wood meal could collect. Soon the wood meal began to glow, and she gently fanned it with her hand. She placed dry tinder close beside it and fanned it into a blaze. Then Strongarm told her to teach her daughters how to make fire. He and Firekeeper were growing old, but he knew their clan would always need fire. Firekeeper remembered what Strongarm said, and she taught her daughters to make fire. A few years after, all the clans on the hills had someone who knew how to make fire. In some clans, a woman did this work. In others, young girls did it. In some clans, this work was done by men. Everywhere, people had someone to make and take care of the fire. Things to do. Show how Strongarm taught Firekeeper to make fire. Examine the sticks that you selected some time ago for a fire drill. If you choose a hard piece for a spindle, your drill will work better if you choose soft wood for the hearth. Round the ends of the spindle and make a shallow hole with a groove beside it in the hearth. Make a shallow hole in a flat piece of wood. To hold the upper end of the spindle. After you learn to work the drill with your hands, try a strap. When you can use the strap easily, try a bow. If you keep on trying, you will be able to get fire with your fire drill. Chapter 35 Things to Think About have you ever read stories not written in books? Can you think how large pieces of rock get broken off from the cliffs? Can you think how they become smooth and rounded? How do you think that the pebbles you find along the stream got there? See if you can track a pebble up the valley of the stream in which you found it. What does the river take with it as it journeys toward the sea? What part of its load drops first? Chapter 35 How People Know What the Cavemen Did Perhaps you have wondered if these stories are true. Let us see if we can find out how we got them. You know that the cavemen lived long ago. You know that they could not read or write. You know that they did not write any stories. But they told their children the brave deeds of their people. They told them of combats with wild beasts. They told them stories about their gods. Their children told these stories again. These stories were told a great many times. Sometimes, parts of the stories were left out and other parts put in. Only part of the cavemen's story is left, and it tells only a few things that the cavemen did. But there are other ways of learning about them. We have learned something from the weapons that have been found. Perhaps you have done something like this yourself. 
Perhaps you have found an Indian arrow. Perhaps you can read what it tells of the Indians. That will help you to learn more about the cavemen. You remember the time that the caves were flooded, and the tools and weapons were washed away. They were dropped on the flooded plains and buried in the sands and gravels. There have been many floods since then, and each time the river has dropped part of its load. So the weapons have been buried very deep. Sometimes. People have dug deep down into the earth, and sometimes they have found the cavemen's weapons. There are pictures of some of them in this book. Can you see that they tell what the cavemen did? Bones too have helped to tell something of the cavemen. A great many bones have been found in the caves. Most of the marrow bones were split. Animals do not know how to split bones, so we know that they must have been split by men. These bones have been taken to great museums where wise men have studied them carefully. The wise men have learned to read their story. The bones tell that the cavemen ate animal food. They tell what animals lived at that time. They tell that people were living then too. Perhaps you have seen fossil plants and rocks. Some of them tell what plants were living then. Many people have studied all these things. They have tried to read all the stories they tell. We have tried to learn what they have found and to write it in a story for you. Can you understand now how these stories are true? End of section twelve. End of the early cavemen, by Catherine Elizabeth Dot.